You're on a journey through the Bible to experience the epic story of God and to learn your part to play in the unfolding drama. Prepare for your role as you learn your history, your enemy, and your king. Welcome to the Bible Brief. Join us today as we see a baby Israelite floating in the Nile River before we hear him called by God out of a burning bush. You're listening to the Bible Brief. In Era 1, Beginning, and in Era 2, Fathers, we formed a foundation for everything else that occurs in the Bible story. We saw the basic problem of the Bible, with the fall of man leading to corruption in the heart of mankind. But later we saw the initial promise of a seed of the woman coming to defeat the serpent, and the Abrahamic covenant giving additional structure to the way in which God will set things right and bless the whole world. As we move forward in the Bible, we're going to continue our focus on the nation through whom God would bring this promised descendant of the woman, the one who will also be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who will come from Jacob's nation, Israel. So let's get started as the family of Israel expands to the nation of Israel. The book of Exodus begins with a rehash of what has happened since Joseph, that favorite son of Israel, saved the Near East from famine with God's help. As second in command over Egypt, Joseph had helped lead the country to save grain during the years of plenty in order to have rations enough for the seven years of famine that would follow. Remember, it was in this context that Israel's family all came to Egypt to settle and last out those years of famine. But what was a temporary stay became a home for centuries. Israel stays in Egypt for over 400 years. And Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and increased rapidly. They multiplied and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. The twelve sons of Israel were expanding into the twelve tribes of Israel. Each of the sons had a lot of babies, and in turn that generation did the same. This repeated until hundreds of years later, they became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. These twelve tribes, the peoples from each of Israel's twelve sons, would become the main divisions of the nation for the remainder of the Bible. This nation, however, is a nation within a nation. They're not in their own land, because they're in the land of the nation of Egypt. They'd been growing strong and multiplying as Pharaoh after Pharaoh reigned over Egypt. But eventually this Israelite nation within Egypt came to be viewed as a threat. A new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become too numerous and too powerful for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase even more. And if a war breaks out, they may join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So the Egyptians appointed taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. The Egyptian pharaoh is worried about the number of the Israelites. He sees that they're dominant in Egypt, and he's afraid that they may become uncontrollable. Not knowing Joseph, he doesn't respect the fact that one of the sons of Israel was responsible for the survival of Egypt in the first place. Not only does this pharaoh begin to oppress them in slavery, but soon he commands the infanticide of all the baby boys born to the Israelites. In the midst of this, a baby boy is born to one of the Israelite slaves, who's then placed in a basket on the Nile River. His mother is trying to somehow save him from death because of Pharaoh's decree, and ironically, the baby is discovered by an Egyptian princess. He's given the name Moses, and as he grows, he enters the household of Pharaoh. He's an Israelite man from a generation whose boys were killed off by the wicked king, yet Moses spends decades in the household of Pharaoh. That is, until around age 40, when he sees the cruel treatment of an Israelite slave. Moses, taking matters into his own hands, murders the Egyptian taskmaster before fleeing into the desert. Moses spends the next few decades away from Egypt. He gets married, has children, and keeps sheep. The years pass, and Egypt becomes a memory until something big happens. 
a burning bush causes the life of Moses to change forever. It's in the desert, in the burning bush, that God reveals himself to Moses. Forty years after Moses murdered a man in Egypt, God calls him to go back to Egypt on a new mission. Moses is to go and demand that the new Pharaoh release the Israelites from their slavery. But that's not all. Because in this fateful conversation, God also reveals something about himself. He reveals his identity, as Moses asks the name of the God of their fathers. Moses asked God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also told Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. This is the first time in the Bible when God reveals his preferred name to anyone. This name is often translated as either Jehovah or Yahweh, but it's essentially four Hebrew letters that carry with them a somewhat complex meaning. In this passage, these four letters are translated as, I am who I am. God's name is a statement about God's identity, which is effectively, I am. Now, when people say that, they're essentially talking about a being or a state. I am tired or I am hungry. This statement by God, however, is not about a shifting state. It's about a constant one. God is expressing his identity as the one who was, who is, and who is to come. The one who simply exists. The one who has always and will always exist. Said a bit differently, God's name is an expression of his eternality. I am. God's identity is the always present one, who is the God of all ages. This is how he wants to be remembered by all generations. In this conversation with Moses, God has revealed his identity as the Eternal One. After being commissioned by God, Moses goes back to Pharaoh and demands that he let the Israelites leave Egypt. But Pharaoh resists the demand, and we soon see the ten plagues that God sends upon Egypt. These ten plagues are effectively God's demonstration of his supremacy over the fake gods of Egypt. And while the Bible doesn't detail this out, archaeologists have discovered evidence that the Egyptians had false gods corresponding to each plague that the true God sent upon Egypt. In a sense, I am who I am was saying to these fake gods, you're not, and the plagues prove it. These ten plagues culminate in the death of the firstborn of every house in the land of Egypt. God hadn't forgotten that Pharaoh had commanded the destruction of the baby Israelite boys of Moses' generation. And in this final plague, God provides not just judgment, but retribution for the actions of the wicked pharaohs against the Israelites. But this final plague didn't simply exclude the Israelites. It demanded a response from them so that they could escape the death of their firstborn. In order to escape the plague, they had to put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes. God would see the blood and pass over the homes, not visiting them with this fierce judgment. The blood of the lamb was a substitute for the blood of the firstborn. But there's more to this monumental event called the Passover. The Passover, in fact, becomes an event associated with the beginning of each year in the Israelite calendar for future generations. On the tenth day of the first month of every year, God commanded that the Passover meal, consisting primarily of a one-year-old male lamb prepared in a specific way, should be eaten as a feast to commemorate God's deliverance of the people from Egyptian slavery. God says this to the people, You are to keep this command as a permanent statute for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, you are to keep this service. When your children ask you, What does this service mean to you? You are to reply, It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt 
when he struck down the Egyptians and spared our houses. The people of Israel were to keep this ceremonial meal generation after generation. And this Passover at around 1500 BC marked the beginning of the formal sacrificial system in the nation of Israel, to which many other sacrifices would be added. But this one, the Passover, was the first and helped mark the beginning of the year. By killing a lamb, roasting it, eating it on the same day in the same way each year, it would be hard to forget what God had done for the Israelites. God had passed over their houses in his judgment on the firstborn of Egypt, because God saw the blood of the Lamb. It was at a Passover celebration about 1,500 years later that this meal would gain an even more heightened significance. A different kind of lamb, not a one-year-old from the flock, but a man from Nazareth, would say monumental words to twelve Israelites gathered around the table. He would take the bread, give thanks, break it, and give it to them, saying this, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Passover meal that was a memorial for all generations of Israelites would gain an even greater meaning. Instead of an animal slain, a body was broken. God's lamb would be the substitute for every person in the world, and his blood would be applied to the doorpost of every heart that would cling to him in faith. The Passover meal is the great memorial feast of the whole Bible. It announces salvation from slavery, and it reveals the very heart of God's identity. It's as if God shows something else behind the I am, so that we humans can see more of his character. Something like... I am the Savior, which not coincidentally was the name of Jesus in Hebrew. Yeshua, meaning God saves. Join us next time as we see the nation of Israel in the wilderness. Egypt is behind them, and God has miraculously saved his people. But the road is hard and the wilderness is rough. It's in the wilderness that God proves himself not to be just a savior, but provider. For Bible readings, reflection questions, and quizzes, don't miss the Bible Brief app. Available on iOS and Android, so you can go deeper into the story. The Bible Brief is a project of the Bible Literacy Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to helping you learn the Bible. Give to support the Bible Brief by visiting biblebrief.org or tap the Give link in the show notes. Thank you for supporting the Bible Literacy Foundation.